Hello YouTube, welcome to my channel. This is a tutorial on rickettsia from the Department of Microbiology. Let's begin right away. Rickettsia are obligate intracellular parasites. They are gram-negative, pleomorphic, non-motile rods. They are parasitic to arthropods such as fleas, lice, ticks, and mites. Rickettsia cannot grow on standard cell culture media, but can grow well in egg yolk of embryonated eggs and several monoclonal cell culture lines. There has been no human-to-human -human transmission of the infection. So Rickettsia belongs to the order Rickettsialis, the family Rickettsiaceae, the tribe Rickettsiae, and the genus Rickettsia. And there are three main groups of species that are pathogenic to humans, and we will discuss them later in the presentation. But basically, these are species that cause spotted fever, species that cause typhus, and other species that are significant to human infection. Rickettsia probozeki causes epidemic typhus and Braille zensor disease via the transmission of a human body louse. Rickettsia typhi causes endemic typhus via the rat flea, a bite from a rat flea. Rickettsia rickettsiae causes rocky, rocky mountain spotted fever via transmission of ticks. Rickettsia conori causes botanias fever. Rickettsia australis will cause Australian tick typhus via transmission of a tick bite. Rickettsia siberica will cause Siberian tick typhus, again by transmission via a tick bite. Rickettsia acari will cause Rickettsia pox with the bite of mites. Moving on to general pathogenesis, Rickettsia are transmitted to humans by the bite of an infected arthropod vector. They multiply at the site of entry and enter the bloodstream. Now, Rickettsia being obligate intracellular parasites, they grow and multiply in the nuclear or vascular endothelial cells that are lining the atrials and venules. This, therefore, causes vasculitis and there's an increase in vessel permeability. Consequently, blood begins to leak out to the adjacent tissues and this may lead to a rush which is seen in the clinical picture and further damage to organs and tissues. And now this bleeding, this blood that is leaking out leads to the activation of the coagulation cascade, which then causes thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So before we go in to talk about the symptoms and the clinic, let me remind you of the groups of rickettsia infection. These are the typhus fever and the spotted fever group. So let's talk about epidemic typhus. Epidemic typhus, otherwise known as classical typhus, is caused by Rickettsia prowazaki, and the vector is the human body louse or the human head louse, with her incubation being 5 to 21 days. And the mortality of epidemic typhus is 20 to 30 percent if untreated. And the symptoms of epidemic typhus are severe headache, chills, generalized myalgia, high fever in the figures of 39 to 41 degrees Celsius, patient may present with vomiting, macular rush that occurs after 4 to 5 days and it begins first on the trunk and spreads to the limbs. The patient may also have lack of consciousness. So for Braille Zinsa, which is also recrudescent typhus, this occurs after the person recovered from epidemic typhus and then there's a reactivation of Rickettsia prowazeki, which remained latent for years and this may cause mild illness and low mortality rate. So basically a patient may have had suffered in their 20s and then Braille Zinsa may occur when they're in their 60s. The infection may occur when they're in their 60s. So now let's talk about endemic typhus, also known as murine typhus. This is an infection that is caused by rickettsia typhi, the vector being a rat flea, and infection occurs after a bite by a rat flea, and the reservoir being a rat. And as for spotted fever group, the first one on the list we will talk about is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is the most severe form of all spotted fevers caused by Rickettsia rickettsiae, and the infection occurs after the tick bite, incubation being only one week, and more similar to typhus fever, but the rush appears earlier and is more prominent. So here's an image of what the rush looks like on the chest as well as the soles of the foot. And the image on the display, we may also see late particular rushes that present on the palm and the forearm. Image to the right. So the complications of rickettsia diseases are bronchopneumonia, congestive heart failure, multi organ failure, deafness, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, myocarditis, endocarditis, and glomerulonephritis. 
So now about diagnosis, laboratory diagnosis is the main form of diagnosis and these are serology and isolation on experimental animals. The specimen that we take is blood and you need to collect this blood in the when the patient is in the febrile, febrile period of the illness. So in the isolation method of laboratory diagnosis, blood is inoculated in guinea pigs or mice and then the animals are observed on the third to the fourth week um, bearing in mind that animal responds to different rickettsial species differently. And the symptoms in the animals would be a rise in temperature in all species and scrotal inflammation, swelling, and necrosis only observed in Rickettsia typhi, Rickettsia conari, Rickettsia acari, except Rickettsia prowazaki. So the next method used is serology. And serology is a very reliable test to confirm Rickettsial diseases where there's two methods that they use, antibody detection by whale felix test and antigen detection by immunofluorescent, immunofluorescent assay. So the next test is the whale felix reaction test, which is a heterophil agglutination test. It is a type of test in which the patient's serum is tested for agglutinins to all antigens of certain non-motile proteus and rickettsia strains, which are OX19, OX2, and OXK. OX19, OX2 are strains of Proteus vulgaris. OXK is the strain of Proteus mirabilis. So now the procedure of this test is that serum is diluted in three separate series of tubes, followed by the addition of equal amounts of OX19, OX2, and OXK in separate series of tubes. Then the tubes are set up to incubate at 37 degrees for overnight. Then now you observe for agglutination. To interpret the results, strong agglutination with OX19 means there's a positive result for epidemic and endemic typhus. A strong agglutination with OX19 and OX2 um, entails that there's a spotted, spotted fever infection. Strong agglutination with OXK entails that that's a scrub typhus infection and scrub typhus by Orientia susungamushi which is one of the rickettsia diseases. And the other method of uh, serological laboratory diagnosis is immunofluorescent assay, as you can see on the image on the display. So other serological tests that may be taken are complement fixation tests, latex agglutination tests, enzyme immunoassay, and not that all tests use rickettsia antigens only to detect rickettsia antibodies. So as far as treatment, the first line of treatment is doxycycline, and treatment should be started early in the first week of illness. Then if doxycycline is not a first choice, you may take tetracycline. Vector control is the number one method of prophylaxis. There is a live vaccine as well as a killed vaccine available, but they're not much effective.